Welcome to That Annuity Show, the podcast that will make you an expert in explaining annuities to your clients. Give us 30 minutes each week and we'll shave hours from your client presentations. Now, here's your host, Paul. Hi, this is Paul Tyler and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. Tisa, it's great to see you. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And, Good morning. Uh, you know, T, T, you know, if, if you listen to that intro. Tisa does our our intro, Ramsey, over the sound of a race car engine. Okay. Yeah. How ironic. <laughs> this is ironic for this for this episode. I I can't wait to dive in. You brought us some 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 great guests today to talk about annuities and race cars. Okay. Yeah. We're not getting off the car this show without yeah. talking about some race cars here. What, why don't you uh, please set the episode up? Sure, happy to. So, uh, very delighted to have a uh, a couple of uh, good friends and and uh, and former colleagues join the join the show today. We've got Justin Wee, who's the president of Gamebridge, and we have Giant Walia, who's the head of business development at Gamebridge. Uh, they're both part of a uh, a very innovative organization called Group One Thousand and One, and we're looking forward to covering uh, really a whole whole host of of areas where they're they're having an impact in in, in our industry so look with that I'll, I'll hand it over to the two of you justin perhaps we can uh, we can start with you tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about group 1001 uh and gamebridge and uh and maybe you know some of this ubiquitous branding we see absolutely uh good morning everyone um uh Group 1001 is a collective, a financial collective of companies that is really focused on insurance products. Um, part of that mission includes uh, companies like Delaware Life and ClearSpring Life and Annuity, which uh, you know are, are names that uh, a lot of consumers will already be familiar with. Um, but it also includes a company called Gamebridge, which is in and of itself uh, an insurance company that's about, call it five, six years old, that's really focused on providing accessibility to uh, pockets of the market that are typically underserviced, opportunities to engage with consumers that are thinking about financial products or accessing financial products in a different way. Um, and so we think about Gamebridge as, you know, it's really the brainchild of uh, Dan, Dan Taurus, who is the president and CEO of Group 1001, the holding company. Um, and it was really with this mission of, is there a way to reach um, those that are more tech savvy, that might be younger, that might want to get their education of these annuities a different way. Um, as we know, a lot of the annuity market, agents in the field play a very important role in terms of education, in terms of what do you need to support yourself in retirement. Um, we all know that as we, you know, uh, as time has progressed, you've seen that defined um, d- defined uh, benefit plans are a thing of the past, like less than 15%. Of companies offer that today. We're, we also know that uh, just at the at the national level, there is a what I would say a retirement crisis, where Social Security, what, what has long been relied upon for decades, is at risk unless there is some legislation to address some of the needs of that. I think it's twenty thirty five is when it's will will go insolvent unless something some action is taken. And so there's a need, and you see this proliferation with four hundred one ks for large companies. But a lot of Americans don't have access to a 401k. And so what can they rely on for their retirement and savings? How do they ensure that when they reach their retirement age, that they could, and when they don't have to work, or ideally, that they have enough to survive off of? And that's where Gamebridge fits in. We view ourselves as that part of the market that is increasingly going digital, but also parts of the market that wouldn't necessarily be targeted by an agent, right? Because obviously agents will focus on banks. Um, but focusing on large firms, typically, um, obviously, you do have some that go that, that are independent. But Gamebridge provides that solution where, if an individual um, were to look up retirement or annuity or these words that are, you know, usually coming from a place of concern, place of anxiety, because financial wellness is such a huge component of of people's overall well being, that they have the option to learn about products that will provide compelling returns, the ability to grow their savings, but also the option to monetize those savings in a way that won't outlive their life, their lifetimes. Um, And so that was the, that was the vision of Dan many years ago 
in investing in a platform that provides a digital means in a way that's no commission, that's very transparent, the products are simple to understand. And uh, we expanded that approach uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, so Giant joined about two years ago to lead our business development operations. And, and basically, what we also want to focus is on, on our other segments that are are generally underserved. So I would say, I wouldn't say they're underserved, but the, the way that products are designed oftentimes uh, may not be with them in mind. So one example of that is the registered investment advisor community, right? Like over $9 trillion in assets that sit with these financial advisors. They operate as fiduciaries. They don't collect a commission. They want products that are simple, transparent, um, and that have no commissions, frankly. And so how can we provide that to that segment as well? Along with a lot of tech companies, you're, you're seeing a proliferation of these very well-known uh, tech companies, uh, challenger banks, uh, you know, online brokerage firms that cater to a younger demographic uh, and that provide a slew of different products that include everything from your checking account to a credit card, all the way to brokerage accounts and savings accounts. And we believe that annuities fits very uniquely within that because even though it is a, we all know the numbers, over $400 billion per annum in sales per year in the United States, it is still a pretty unknown market to a lot of segments of the population, particularly as you go younger, right? I, I, I'm shocked by how many people who are under 40 who don't really know what an annuity is. And so these are tools that uh, have been around for many, many decades, but there's an opportunity to expand the market uh, and grow as, as, as particularly as we start seeing a, a, a more an aging population, uh, a population that starts struggling with retirement, and so that's that's a mission of of, of Gainbridge and and where we fit within Group One Thousand One. So, so a couple things, a couple things there. For among other things, I mean, you mentioned the the uh, the annual the annual uh, issuance of annuities. Uh, beyond the fact that there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, constituencies that aren't familiar with annuities yet a lot of the sales we see every year are essentially sort of turnover right they're exchanges of of uh of of uh, essentially policies going into surrender so the potential upside in this space is really really quite dramatic there really is a great space for new for new uh, for new participants but um why don't we double click a little bit on the on the distribution piece of it and, and Jayant, maybe you have some yep. some some things you'd like to add there so Group one thousand one, Gamebridge specifically, you've been you've been very innovative in a lot of ways in in this space. Like, what are what are some of the things that have been uh, key wins and a key focus in the in the in recent years, and are likely to be continue to be a real focus in in the next year or two? Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you, Ramsey, Paul, Tisa. Uh, this is great uh, for calling us. Um, excited to have this conversation. So, I. Um, so I think double clicking on what Justin said earlier, which is annuities, of course, is a big market. Uh, incredible amount number of sales that happen year on year, growing market. And there is a specific need and use case for the distribution that currently exists. It serves an important role, right? Uh, but I would largely think of how, if you want to draw a parallel with what happened in banking, for example, like Justin also briefly mentioned about challenger banking or tech first finance, right? Where changing how a certain segment or delivering the same kinds of product to an underserved segment in, an, in the way they might react to it better sort of changes the game. You open up a new market and, and you're seeing so many incredible numbers that are happening within the banking space. And that was basically the impetus of us doing Gainbridge on our side is like the market that currently exists is big and growing and, and the players that are serving an important role, but the same financial product at its core principle, which is protection and retirement, is still important to this other segment of users that just don't know, even know how to access it. So let alone whether they want to buy it or not, they just probably don't know or how you're reaching to them is, is now is, 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 has to be in the way that they consume financial services. Right. Um, and of course, technology would have been a big part of that. So the first thing, uh, the vision of Gainbridge in the in, in the in that sense was to have a direct to consumer business, which is 
gamebridge.io. You can go online in a matter of minutes, go through the process, look at our products available, simple to understand, and decide whether this product is for you based on the information you get. Uh, and if it is, then go through that enrollment experience that is seamless where you can buy an annuity uh, and then do all the servicing accordingly post issuance. Uh, the argument there was that, you know, to, in today's world, it is so easy now to get a bank account. It is so easy to make your payments. So why should getting an insurance product be the in, an incredibly cumbersome experience? Understanding that regulation and compliance are important and these are regulated products. But even after incorporating that, can through your technology, can that be the customer experience be a defining mode for a business? And how does that mode translate into actual sales and user acceptance? So our D2C business was the sort of anchor for that thought process, and we're seeing incredible results on that. And then we said, okay, how do we branch this out and use our understanding and learning about this kind of distribution channel and enable partners to do the same, where we are the experts in the infrastructure for our annuity products, but we can enable them to be successful by offering the benefits of these products to their user base. But instead of, they're not probably insurance companies, they are probably uh, not maybe not be experts in annuities, depending on who we partner with, but that's where we come in and they can leverage our infrastructure, integrate with us, leverage our APIs and or just embed our product within their ecosystem to have their users get access to it. And I think that is, again, if you think about parallels, we talk about embedded finance and you know embedded banking. This is, uh, that was kind of the parallel we draw on annuities, like why not? Uh, if there, if you prove the case that there is a need for this kind of product, if you can, if you believe that there's a user base that is currently not accessing the product, but there is, uh, but could, but could find it very useful for them, then the same concepts of embedded banking, embedded finance can be applied here, in which is what we're trying to do, and then of course the D two C angle that we've already been successful at, and we're hoping to grow further. Oh, okay. We we have a lot right yeah. <laughs> yeah. in these com comments. I, I guess. The first, um, first, just comment I'm gonna say is, hey, congratulations! I think think that Justin Jay, I mean, what you're doing is really, really different, and it's it's great to see that in the industry, and it's great to see it continue. Um, so, um, you know, hats off. Um, anytime you do something, you know, you assume you have like these three hypotheses, and then you realize, yep. okay, wait, oh no, I was I was wrong, or I was surprised. Can you give us any, you know, what were the surprise learnings? you had can you share with us you know one or yeah. two or three of them so uh, i i can start there one of the big things is is the as i would have alluded to is this lack of understanding of the basics of what the annuity is trying to achieve and when you deal with um, individuals who are coming from a place of they're thinking about retirement they're thinking about end of life they're thinking about these types of very heavy topics you deal with some measure of healthy skepticism particularly when you're dealing with in the financial space. And you've seen this play out. Um, you know, Ramsey and I spent many years on Wall Street. That is something that you constantly have to make sure that you are building a level of trust and credibility and making sure that you do so by providing uh, the, the other party the tools to understand how the products work. It, it comes from a place of I'm not understanding you and I'm not sure what your motives are in terms of you, you trying to sell me this product. And so I think one of the biggest challenges that we continue to face is how do you break that? How, how do you breach that? How do you basically get to the other side where the other party is listening? And I think that one of the benefits of our platform is that it is one that is not a product that is sold by us, but rather one that is bought. The, the typical individual will find us because they see an ad, because they Googled something related to retirement and they saw something that looked interesting. And, you know, as I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, GameBridge has, uh, has invested a lot in terms of authentically reaching out to uh, consumers where they are. So, for example, in sports, uh, we, we obviously have huge investments across uh, women's sports in particular, but a lot of racing, whether it's the Indianapolis 500, Formula One racing, um, a lot of NASCAR events, uh, but also um in Indianapolis, uh, we are the sponsors of Gamebridge Fieldhouse, where the where the where, where the Pacers and the Fever play. Uh, Caitlin Clark is is one of the athletes that we sponsor, so we're very proud of that. But it's a way to connect. It's not because we're saying that, hey, listen, you're watching a basketball game or you're watching a racing event, and then you're like, hey, let's let's talk about retirement. 
it's a way for uh, them to peek on just like what is Gamebridge trying to do and how do some of the values related to like the, the idea of, of sports and making sure that you know investing is hard savings is hard it's hard work and we're trying to meet people where they are in places where they are very engaged um and oftentimes that'll come very organically because of those different connections where they learn about a product and then you have to provide the education so the website uh that gamebridge.io that that john referenced provides a means to just start start the dialogue start the learning and that process but that is a huge barrier uh, I, I would say particularly when you're dealing with products that over many decades it's historically been sold by agents right agents that collect the commission and they play an extremely valuable role because they're the ones across the table and the average age typically of the annuity buyer is, 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 is north of 50 years old. Right. And so oftentimes you might be dealing with a, a client base that prefers that hands-on approach that they're talking to someone, but we want to provide that option for other types of consumers as well, meet them where they are. But that's, that to me is, is a huge barrier. Um, I would say building a digital platform as well, because as John mentioned, we are a, uh, a startup in terms of mentality, but let's be clear. We're a regulated industry <laughs> at, at every level. These are people's retirement. We're not selling widgets on Amazon or any other website. We're selling policies that are people's hard-earned savings, right? Um, these could be 401, savings from 401ks that get rolled over. These could be just cash that's been saved over many years and they're debating whether I sh they should buy a, a certificate of deposit or maybe invest in the stock market because they hear some great things that are going on. Uh, but they're also like, but I saved so much. I saved, I saved this over many years and I'm going to retire in X number of years. How do I, how do I make sure it's protected? How do I make sure that I have some level of insurance from that? And so what some of the challenges that you encounter as a digital platform is how do you position that in a way that is, uh, balanced that um, obviously you're not, we do have a call center. So at any point in time, any individual could say, I don't understand this or I have a question on the process. You could call in so that, that, that exists, but it's not, it, it's not the default, right? Like oftentimes you could go through a process and have questions. So how do you make sure that you are you're being clear and complete in your explanations and also making sure that your products are represented in a balanced way in a digital format, whether it's on your phone which is increasingly the way that most people, uh, you know, surf the web or on a desktop. And so those are two big challenges that I've seen in the space. Um, and then John, I'm sure you could speak to it, but it, that, that proliferates not just to the end consumer, but also to uh, businesses, enterprises, whether you're an RIA or some of the tech companies that John mentioned, they have right. the same types of questions. So how do you educate that market and say, Hey, this is great for your business because you cater to the financial wellness of individuals. And this is good, not just for them, but it's also good for your business. It's not taking away from what you're doing. It's adding to that. It adds another arrow in your quiver. Uh, John, I don't know if you would add anything to that. No, I, yeah, I think all of that um, plus one on uh, in terms of observations and some of the barriers. And I think for me, two things. One uh, was surprising that Justin already alluded to, um, which is, even though like we said it again, like annuities is such a big market. Um, it was, it was interesting that when trying to go into these newer segments or like uncharted territory for the most part, or maybe not as penetrated, how much of the process started with education, whether it's D2C uh, in our D2C business or even in our B2B business. Right. Uh, and that was a very interesting sort of dynamic, but I will say that allowed us to also think a little bit more on first principle basis, right? It's like, what are we trying to solve for? And what is the gap that we're actually trying to cover? We'll think whether we can call it an annuity or XYZ retirement product for now, but like what is actually we're trying to solve for your customer base? Or if you're talking directly to the user, what do you have? What are you trying to solve for? Right. And I think that at least helps us get more insight of the market and and sort of remove some of our preconceived notion of what an annuity is or is not to certain people. Which leads me into my second point of like what was surprising for me is honestly of how many younger people and I, we all read these reports and, and things of that nature, how Gen Z or millennials are care more about retirement or thinking about it. But it's different because I, I mean, I'm a millennial myself. And if I'm being honest, 
three, four years ago, I didn't, it's not like I'm speaking about retirement, but I do care about it. But I never really noticed how much I mm-hmm. care about it till I saw other people behave within GainBridge, in, in my green, within my GainBridge lens, looking at customers and end users. So that gave me a lot of, um, I feel like positive sentiments of like what the potential for this market is. And more importantly, what an impo- what the role we as providers or producers and, and state distributors or uh, carriers fill and can and have a role to play in sort of this next generation. Um, so that was some on the more positive side, but of course that would require innovation again, continuous innovation in how we distribute, continuous innovation in other products we create. Uh, and then, of course, continuous innovation, like to Justin's point of the education that we give to people around that. Giant on the education side. So I had a question. I was thinking right. about some of the underserved, under access markets you were talking about. You're talking about the younger market. Yeah. Um, from a digital customer journey, um, how are you outside of search traffic? I understand that. Like, kind of, how are you finding that market? And, and the follow up question to that is. Uh, thinking through the education, but also it sounds like a little bit of uh, the younger generation may have positive sentiment, but they may not, like you're also maybe um, generating demand at the same time, right? right? Because they're not quite ready to make the purchase, but they need to understand and start thinking about what that purchase or what the product's going to be. So can you talk a little bit about finding that that market and then um, the combination of both educating and sort of driving the demand at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in terms of finding the market, it, it really is, like you said, of course, there are traditional pay channels and, and the traditional marketing sort of efforts that come. But ultimately, you think of this as a multi-channel approach, right? Um, paid and everything, you know, sort of th- those kinds of traditional marketing channels work. But we also try to be in the conversation uh, of specific platforms uh, and specific sort of outlets where there's an active conversation about money management, financial awareness, mm-hmm. right? So that uh, typically we are seeing uh, our presence felt and our presence known in avenues where we know people are going and trying to learn about retirement, financial awareness, financial education, financial wellness. Not We don't restrict ourselves to just retirement-focused conversations. We've, we, we've, we will find our presence in content and in areas wherever financial wellness is a topic uh, because um, we believe that, yes, because it's a tax deferral nature and all of that, it makes sense for annuities to be a retirement product, sure. But at the fundamental basis of it, we are talking about a principle-protected um, uh, account to put your money in to grow in, in, a, in a predictable manner uh, and that has an allocation in your portfolio to how you should think about that. So I think being in those ch- in those specific avenues, platforms, and channels is important and sort of broaden our horizon. The f- and coupling with that is um, the some of the efforts that uh, Justin said that we have around marketing and just brand awareness. Brand we want, part of it is not necessarily that, oh, Gainbridge, it, it's to create that curiosity about Gainbridge. And then, of course, it's a lot of work on our website that when people come in, they have a sense of what we are, but then we educate them or at least tell them what exactly we're trying to build and how uh, and how we're sort of trying to change the landscape of financial wellness uh, effectively. So I think that brand focus is incredibly important for us because it generates, it tries to create gain which is a household name. It creates a demand or in terms of just demand from people to learn at least about or curiosity about the brand. And then on the other side, we ourselves insert make sure that we are on those channels where financial wellness is a hot topic for different uh, people across demographics. And what we see is younger demographics uh, or people of younger demographic are actually also engaging with us um, during those conversations. So that's on yeah. the on the channel side. In terms of education, I think Justin, I wanted to double click a point that Justin made is like, we try to have everything available in terms of in our website, in, the, in our experience and simplify products to the extent possible for the betterment of customers. Ultimately, they have to go through it and decide for themselves if this is the right product or not. Uh, but can we educate them the best possible way? And while we do that digitally in terms of distribution and, and giving access, we fundamentally do believe that finance at the end of the day is also a human uh, experience, right? Right. And it's not that technology is replacing humans. There is definitely a need for humans as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but it is just a, it's augmenting that experience and making it more efficient. So why, what I what do I mean by that? I mean that if somebody comes in and gets understanding of our product or wants to learn more, there is hundred percent access to gain with representatives and professionals where they can. And the pure and the beauty of that is that they can call in and they're not selling to the to the person. They're literally there to educate the person. Mm-hmm. And that also, I feel like, creates a matter of trust. It's like, okay, I want to call in. I want to understand uh, and, and, and if it's right for me or not. Ultimately, it's my decision as a user. So, it's, so it is that human experience is incredibly part of our process when it comes to education. Yeah. We here have um, spent some time um, right. testing and learning with uh, digital buying experience, both for consumers and agents. And right. My comment would be there's absolutely always going to be a role for a person. Right. It just depends on the individual buyer as right. to when they're ready to stop their independent research and talk to a person to validate what they've learned. Right. Um, so, yeah, you talked about some of the surprises you've, you've had in your process of building out your model and having a human available you know, at, at every point, and it's going to differ for each buyer, uh, is definitely something we found, either a phone call or a chat um, when people are ready to, to validate. That's what they want to do. They want to hear a voice and build that trust. So. Yeah, along those lines, you know, Ramsey, I'll pass the mic to you. Um, D2C is a really hot topic inside insurance companies. <laughs> I mean, last three carriers have been at, oh, you, you talk about D2C, you throw it up, it's all, it's, oh my gosh, the gloves come off, that'll never work. And it's really kind of a false premise to begin with because, I mean, there have been a lot of big insurance companies that have grown up with direct consumer marketing. You know, Allstate was in Sears. That was a booth in a you know in a Sears store. <laughs> Look where they they went. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of companies have been successful with direct mail. Um, I can't turn on a television screen without seeing you know some people selling term life um, on 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 television. Yet. Um, you know, a lot of these new companies had some great ideas, you know, then started in the last 10, you know, five or six years and wow, there's carnage out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what's the, what's the new model? I, I'm going to say, let's not say D to C, but like, maybe you could just, could, you know, you've, you've kind of, we've kind of talked a, a lot about that. What's the, take off D to C, what do you say the model of the future is for selling annuities or, or insurance generally? I don't believe that the current model that we have, which predominates, it's predominantly, you know, agent stole policies. It's hard for me to say in this market that's growing over 20% year over year, that is driven by agents who are trusted by, as, as, as an individual, uh, as a financial advisor, that that's going to be replaced anytime soon. That's not the goal here. Uh, you're talking about a market, as I mentioned, that's about $400 billion dollars. Uh, in the context, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket if you think about the, the amount of wealth uh, retirement assets in the United States, right? And growing. And so we view it as kind of like the, the way we approach it. And Tisa, you know, you talked about this. It's technology is a door opener. Mm-hmm. At a minimum, if you build it the right way and you provide the tools, it provides the ability for an individual to do the R&D and the research. And then they can pursue whatever path they want to take, Right. Uh, I, I have a nephew who is just graduated from college. I suspect he may just want to do it all the way through on his own. That's a suspicion. Um, I have parents who are retired who, if I were to ask them to do this, they would get, they would look at the first page and then they'd call right away because they prefer to deal with it that way. That's not to say that that's true for every person of certain age groups, but it's just an example I'm giving you of two ways that people are making financial decisions and learning about a product. Um, and so the, the D to C model, again, like it, D to C is just a, a short winded way of saying, listen, we're trying to provide direct access to you without the, the need, the requirement of a physical intermediary or a personal intermediary in the middle. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't have that. It just provides that option and everyone has approached it differently. So I hate to say that all, of, you know, you had mentioned a few different examples of other insurance carriers. I think I have the benefit, and I think Giant does too, is that we haven't been in the D to C game for very long, and certainly not in the insurance space. So maybe ignorance is bliss here. So we're just we're, what we're doing is we're charting our own path in terms of. I, I did not, uh, you know, I worked in financial services for many years, I, as I alluded to, but I did not sell annuities, right? Um, some experience there from 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 the other side of it, working at a bank, 
but I've, I've, I view myself more closely related to the consumer side than I would the person who's, you know, yeah. creating the products. At least that's that, that's reflected in in my experiences, my professional experiences. And so, a lot of the folks that we have at GameBridge um, don't have that background, and so they approach it very similarly. Is like, does this make sense to me when I'm reading this? Am I when I'm looking at these uh, contracts and these product summaries? What do some of these acronyms mean? How do we approach that? And so there are certain, like this, I, I touched upon this in the second kind of um, obstacle about starting a digital business is that there's certain terminology that is very commonly known in the industry. But if you were to speak to someone else on the street, they wouldn't know what that means. And so how do you make sure that you're connecting with the people who are savvy enough to know this or have heard certain things from an advisor, but also connecting with those that for which you're just using jargon that that's not going to connect with them? And so the model, I would say, it's an evolving one. So let's start there because uh, GameBridge, as I mentioned, has been around for a few years now, but we've done different iterations. If you looked at our website um, as recently as a year ago, it looks very different now. And so there's a lot of experimentation that's going on in terms of what are the types of channels where we can meet these people? What's the type of messaging that resonates? Um, How do we design the products so that you can remove some of those bells and whistles, right, that, you know, are often necessary in a product, but are kind of described in a way that's not always clear to the other side, right? It's, it, it's a different, it's a different thing when you're trying to re- explain something on a, on a, a, a web page or through some user experience that doesn't require any humans versus if I could literally call you and walk you through and handhold you. And so, that's always a challenge we go through, and it's it's a constantly evolving process. Uh, and it's a and I can tell you everything from our product folks who design the website to the people who design the financial products. Like when I say products, it's interesting because we're a tech company as well, right? So product for us is the platform; it's how you access it. But then there's the product, which a lot of people in finance know the annuity itself. How do you design that? And then obviously you know, we have to develop a new terminology with our compliance and our legal teams because we want to make sure it is clear, it is balanced, and there's not ambiguity. When I say one thing, and you already know it is another thing because you'd heard it, that it, that that's clear. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Paul. It's it's a tough one, but it's something that I'm humbled by every day because we learn something new. We might do something and be like, oh, wait, no one's getting that. And you could see it because we have a digital experience. So all the traffic we bring in. Oh, I saw a drop off at this point in the purchasing process. Hmm. Why is that? Let's test that out. Let's try this. If we word it this way or that way, that's part of the beauty of of using technology. So it's very much augmenting the ability for us as an insurance carrier to basically provide these products, provide the education, uh, not replacing. Yeah. All right. Look, I think that that's a great answer, Justin and and, and giant collectively. if there's one thing I've sort of come to the conclusion as I think about this industry, particularly the promise around D to C in some form is that it's a narrow path. It requires patience and a long fuse. And if we look at the, you know, the, the graveyard of D to C startups in this space, I think a lot of it has come down to the fact that they were funded by impatient money, right? And customer acquisition was largely limited to social media and was very expensive. You know, what you have is you have the ability to go through social media, you have the broader brand placement, you know, in a very particular area in sports and with women, which we haven't actually uh, double clicked on, on yet. Uh, and, and, and so many other ways. And it's very clear that you have, you know, you're thoughtful and patient about how to find that narrow path over time. And I think that that's what's required to be successful in this space. So uh, I do want to shift gears a little bit because this is a great conversation and there's still a couple things that we've left on the table here. Did so you say one... shift gears, Ramsey? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was totally, uh, totally coincidental. Yes, I did. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, your, your thought process on the use of APIs because like, one of the challenges in this business is, is that often we focus on creating sort of a complete product. But in the end of the day, there are they're actual pieces of the product that are the driver of the revenue. And through using something like an API and connecting it up to somebody else's platform or product, you can actually bring the, you know, focus on the, the, bring your value proposition and revenue source to some other partner. Tell us a little bit about how you're doing that right now. Yeah. 
so um, I think that sort of um, the API channel is another example of the, or the API approach is another example of the embedded strategy that we are trying to adopt. And I think to double click on Justin's earlier point, uh, I think where we see the the future of a new, like the existing, the future of a new distribution, right? The existing market, like Justin said, is big. It serves its value and is continuously growing. So uh, there is a need and which is why that market exists and is growing tremendously. I think what the embedded strategy, the digital strategy, for the way we look at it is not necessarily taking a market share or slice of the pie from what are currently exists, but it's like growing the pie. It's like, how can the future of distribution from a digital landscape, from an embedded landscape, add more potential, add to the target addressable market or the serviceable addressable market uh, for this annuities markets. And so that was effectively the thought as it being a complement or an additive solution to that. And the APIs, um, I think, serve a very important role because ultimately they what, what we are trying to effectively do with that is um, have the regulatory expertise, the backend and the infrastructure, and but allow within the, as much as possible, allow the flexibility for our partners to create the end experience that they think maximizes their opportunity to educate the customer and create a better uh promote a better experience a user experience for the for their for their user base right and and that's what effectively the api strategy stood for um what we have found can I, is can that i just jump in real quick yeah, I, please. I made i made the mistake of, of using an acronym without giving the opportunity to clarify what it is some maybe not everybody's familiar with an api yeah. but just in a few words generically talk about how you know how an api works it's, as a plug-in to bring yeah. your service to somebody else very quickly. And yeah, then absolutely. So, so, so APIs um, effectively think of API as the plug between two systems to interact with each other effectively, right? It's almost like a pipe where I uh, have my own systems, my own, um, you know, uh, annuity pro- or insure, uh, pro- loan processing system mm-hmm. um, or database. And then I want to connect that to a partner's ecosystem or, or, or databases. And then how do those two systems interact with each other is what we call as APIs. It's effectively that you're building a pipe between them and then you make them programmable because they are programmable interfaces. So what that means is that you, that literally your partner can give, can have access to your processes, your systems at the back end, but create their own front end experience. And then behind that, they can programmatically call on specific aspects of your system. It doesn't have to be the entire thing. So for example, when let's say we want to embed our annuity products into a partner via our APIs. So they have their own application. They integrate with our systems. And when I say our systems, it could be- Is there be... a specific example? Is there, a, is there an example you can share? Like So it's, example, it's from our perspective, um, so we are currently- working with one of our partners um, called Safe, right? Mm -hmm. They are necessarily, um, we embed our annuity products within their um, platform. Uh, They have multiple products uh, that called Market Plus, Market Trust, focused on retirements, long-term structured savings, where our annuity is a big conduit uh, within how they structured their products. Now, for them, uh, eventually the goal with Safe is Mm -hmm. To, we right now we have infrastructure and operations in process and how we sort of relate, how we interact with them. But eventually the goal with Save also is now as we're moving towards our API solution. And what that would allow Save to do is to, um, as soon as somebody buys their products, there are certain mechanics at the back end as it relates to the annuities. So creating an application, funding the product, doing our reviews for suitability, things of that nature, right? Without APIs, that has to be a manual process where save then needs to collect those information, give it to us, our teams will review it, our teams will access it, and there's a back and forth maybe through emails, and that's, you have all these uh, SLAs that are involved. But what APIs does is that you can, that as soon as you as save gets information or any partner gets information, they can specifically share that data and calling on specific endpoints of our API. So for example, for when an application comes in, we need to open an annuity application for that, they can call on an application endpoint where suddenly now all the data is gone into our uh, policy management system 
through directly from save systems as soon as they get the customer information through that API feed. Separately, it can be for servicing, it can be for, uh, you know, it could be for withdrawals, any of those things. You can basically build on API endpoints that can get access to your systems um, through your partner. So, so just yeah. quickly, so something that's, if I'm a, if I were a save customer, right. I would have some interaction with save. Save is essentially a, without getting into the details, sort of a saving platform that's built around credit or debit cards, I, 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 as, I, as I understand right. it. But sounds like probably a lot of the questions that you would need to answer in an application would be answered in their application. So exactly. instead of having a redundant process, you take, you have the benefit of everything that they've done on their front end. Yeah. And it passes straight through to yours to, to put, to stack two transactions exactly. where there would have been one. Is that it, 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 yeah. yeah. Maybe you could just grade my definition, definition of what this is, right? Yeah. Language is important. Language yeah. is important, right? It's <laughs> Justin, you mentioned it, right? right? There's the CTO speak. There's a, there's the um, CEO speak very different. I would describe, you know, what, Jan, I'd say, you know, API takes the friction and the cost out of the system. I mean, there's a whole industry. If we put a contract, and this is true, I'm not giving anything away. Last couple of carriers I've worked for, Ramsey, it costs, you know, you take a form, somebody fills out an annuity form, and Tisa, you know, tell me if you disagree. To get that up on an admin platform, it costs like $60. Now, what? To take a form, because... Jan, right? All that stuff you're describing, form yep. comes in, I reprocess, I recut it, I move it around. Tisa does something else Absolutely. and Ramsey does something else. And that's why, you know, we can only, we're only geared to selling these giant insurance policies. Now, what if it, what if we took the cost out? Right? What if it was six cents instead of $60? Because it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a combination of speed, right? There's, there's a speed component to it. There's an accuracy component to it because obviously... The more you start going analog about flat files or people data entry, that's room for error. But it's also security, right? The security mm -hmm. of the data itself. You can build APIs in a way that are very secure. And so a combination of all those things accrues to the benefit of the consumer. And so, you know, GameBridge today, for example, our minimum policy size is $1,000, right? Um, which is, you know, from my understanding, is, is, is pretty great because it doesn't require you to have to put down, you know, our average policy sizes are significantly higher than that because these are retirement savings. But if you wanted to look at this and put in a thousand dollars, you could do so, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's only possible because you've used technology, to your point, Paul, to basically provide leverage to the to the operating side of the business so you can provide those at a better cost to the customer. It also helps you achieve your mission too, right? So the lower barrier to entry, lower cost exactly. to entry. Exactly broadens who can even participate. So That's right. the, the word that was swirling in my head is friction. And I think, I think of two scenarios. I think of meeting a company online via social media, learning about what they're teaching me about and making a buying decision. But I just met you. The API to me opens up leveraging an established relationship or partnership. So I've had the same bank for 20 years. If that bank comes to me and says, hey, you may need this. And I say, yes, I do. And I click a button because you have my name, you have my social security number, you have my addresses, you have, I don't have to fill anything out because you already know who I am and you're passing information for me to make the purchase. It's very different um, than starting from scratch. I just met you and I'm not going to give you my SSN, my date of birth. Oh, by the way, the date of birth of my beneficiaries and my children and tell you my income exactly. and, oh, give you my routing mm -hmm. number and my bank account number? No, <laughs> thank you. Well, you don't have to do that in the scenario you just described, right? Because you're talking through it all you save as the example. You, you have that information to make the withdrawal. So that's where I think the leverage really comes. You get to use the technology you've built um, and, a, and a more digital buying process, but you're leveraging the established relationship that another um, well, company well, has yeah, and, made and with the customer. Exactly. What Tisa is saying, I think uh, what excites me you know, Ramsey, are the new products that enables, you know, we had a lot of, a mm -hmm. couple of startups, you had great ideas. Let's do a, a, create a personal pension plan for millennials, you know, chant, put in 50 bucks a month. Uh, oh, hey, you know, the response Tisa and I got from everybody was it, the economics won't work, you know, right. so you set the contract up, you got to blah, 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 blah. I mean, you know, Ramsey, this looks like perfect, you know, this yeah. seems to be the key for doing what, 
so, mean that mission you're on. We, we all, yeah, what we all want to do. Yes. I, I'm obviously focused specifically on the 401k space, but uh, look, this has been a great conversation. We're, we're actually just uh, <laughs> running out of time and, and a couple of things. One, we didn't get to focus on uh, enough on you know, what you're doing with, uh, with women broadly, right? Creating special products for them, creating attention around retirement, right? Really a real dedicated focus. So, um, you know, let's have you back. Let's have you back to talk about that on a, uh, on a, on a future episode. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think this, this, the innovation here that, that you're bringing to, uh, bringing to the market is very important, both in terms of efficiency, both in terms of leveraging sort of existing, uh, existing trust channels, uh, in terms of uh, trying to break the cross the education gap that amazingly exists in the RIA space, sometimes as much as it exists in in uh, among uh, individuals, one of the, which was sort of an aha moment for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is fantastic. I don't know, Tisa, Paul, any other closing comments before we go? But I, I think this has been a great discussion. No, listen, hey, Tisa, go ahead. Well, I was going to say thanks for your time. Um, again, the, 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 the mission and the, the work you're doing. Um, and I think we'll have you back. We're about to hit playoff season for the WNBA. So I think <laughs> part two, part two yes. can come quite soon. Yeah. So uh, thanks yeah. for your time today. Yeah, exactly. You know, this podcast does travel. We did actually broadcast <laughs> from the Rolling Stones uh, concert a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, and so yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things to, to, to follow in. I mean, I think, or follow on, have a follow on discussion. Jan, I'd like to push harder on, you know, open open insurance, Absolutely. you know what that means. Um, hey, Justin, you know, listen, keep going, doing what you're doing. For Appreciate people it. who, who want to connect with both of you directly or learn more about uh, uh, Gainbridge and, and what you're doing, where, where should they go? Yeah, so um, obviously there's our website at gainbridge.io. Uh, but for those who, uh, you know, I know your audience, you have a lot of financial professionals on this, listening to that annuity show. So I appreciate you having us on. You can also email us at bizdev, so B-I-Z-D-E-V at gamebridge.io, so bizdev at gamebridge.io. It's going to get to the right folks who are, who are monitoring that and whatever, whether it's a partnership opportunity, whether it's to learn more about our products, whether it's like, how do I, you know, how do I get access to this uh, or, or, or do something with you guys to design something together? We're all ears for that because again, as Giant mentioned, we're trying to meet people where yeah. they are, whether you're a consumer, whether you are uh, a CEO of a company that is really focused on financial wellness. So uh, bizdev at gambridge.io. Okay. Hey, listen, terrific, Jan. Thanks. Uh, Thank thanks, so to all, thanks to everybody. And uh, listen, thanks to our listeners. Make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and most importantly, join us again next week for another episode of That Annuity Show. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information at thatannuityshow.com.